Welcome to Sounding Board, a production of Seroptimus International of Novato. In honor of Black History Month, we'll be talking to filmmaker Diana Paul about her film on Miss Margaret, a former granny midwife in the Deep South. And before I introduce Diana, a word about the Seroptimus of Novato. We are an international organization whose mission is to improve the lives of of women and girls through programs leading to social and economic empowerment. I'm Barbara Herwick, and I'll be your moderator today. Welcome, Diana. Thank you. It's good Thank to be here. Thank you for being on our show again. It's a pleasure. Um, before we actually get started on talking about Miss Margaret and your film, uh, let's show our viewers just the first two minutes of your film so they can Good. get a visual image of what yeah. she looks like. Good idea. This morning is 9.30 in Tuscaloosa and you're listening to 790 WTSK, The Truth. We call it the Saturday morning gospel. I'm Margaret Charles Smith. I'm, I live in Green County. I was born and raised. Right around, right over there, across the ditch. 1906, that's what they told me. Oh, 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 I have sometimes four babies a night. Every time I get here, I'd be ready, about ready to go to the man. I had to wait till I get to the pick me up and kid me to the next place. And on and on. I wave water up over my knees and get to people's houses. Ooh. So tell us, how did you find Miss Margaret? Oh, uh, I was at a midwifery conference in Florida. I think it was about 2001. And um, no, it was 2000. And she had been brought there to teach the, uh, some of the student midwives. And I met her on the beach. Uh, she was surrounded by a bunch of young women and telling stories. And <laughs> I had just gone over to get a, a chair to sit in, and I heard her, her, her. Some of her stories were amazing, so I asked if I could film her, and she said yes. And that was the beginning of a just a re wonderful relationship. She's very easy to fall in love with. Oh yes, I totally fell in love with your film, and um, it just, as I was telling you, I think it should be in, in all the museums. Um, <laughs> she, she talked uh, in your film about how, how hard she worked as a sharecropper, and um, do you want to talk uh, to well, the viewers about what that was like for her? Yeah, well, so I was raised in California and not even aware of what sharecropping was, and so Basically, it was another form of slavery uh, it, it, that was practiced in the South. And so uh, children, from the time they were just little and from the time they were capable of it, would have to go to the cotton fields to pick cotton and work. And, and so the sharecropping was that you can use my land, you can grow cotton here, um, and we'll give you a place to, to live, a, a hut, and we'll supply you with a little bit of cornmeal or what, whatever, seeds and things. But they were always in debt to whoever owned the land. And they kept it that way. They kept these people in debt to them, no matter what they did. And so, that, I mean, it was, it was something unthinkable that went on. Right. Um, you know, what struck me when I watched the film is that she mentioned, I believe she was talking about her 
ancestors, but even a after the Civil War, that they worked for two years on the land and didn't even know they were free. Yeah, well, that was in the 1800s when there was slavery. And uh, so, the, so the Union soldiers came by and said, you know, we just have this war and you're free, you're not a slave anymore. They couldn't believe it. Mm. And they were afraid to leave. And so, that, so it was two years before it really sunk in for many, many, many that they did have freedom. Right. And she was from, uh, you, you mentioned in the film, Utah, Alabama, which is a stronghold for the uh, Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. And um, she alluded to that, but didn't talk too much about it. Right. I Yes, she never even used the term Ku Klux Klan or Klan or anything. It, it's a, an organization that seeks to terrify people and oppress them. And uh, it, I think it's still active today, uh, something we have to work out of as a country. But um, she told two stories, and one was that uh, uh, when I asked her about the Klan, she said, well, you know, Bobby... He went down to Bology and he never came back. And that's code for he was killed by the Klan. Right. And then the other thing was when uh, Martin Luther King was speaking in Utah, Alabama, and she was walking to, across town to work, and she heard him speak, but she would not go to the crowd that was listening to him because in former times... Um, People would just shoot into the crowd with, a, you know, if there was a protest or something of that nature, and, and it's very dangerous to be associated with somebody like a Martin Luther King. But um, anyway, so she's just walking by, and her comment to me was, she said she thought at the time, if he kept talking that way, he was going to be murdered. Mm. So those were just the two things that came up when I asked her about the Klan. Wow. Um, so much of your film is, it, it shows such um, images that most of us <clears throat> probably uh, haven't seen or haven't seen in a long time. Uh, some of the poverty that is still exists still down in, still in Utah, Alabama. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and segregation. Still and exists. segregation, right. Um, let's now give our viewers um, a chance to see the turning point in her life when she stood, stood up. up for herself Good. Uh, and told her boss. Uh, well, he wasn't her boss. <laughs> yeah, that she wasn't going back out to the fields again. Yeah. So well, let's take a couple of minutes and, and watch that clip. Okay. Back when I was coming on, it's a hundred percent better now than it was then. If you go to field Monday morning, you come out of Friday night. So the boys man read up on the Friday evening. About three o'clock, I was sitting on the porch. He said, uh, Mark, how come you're in the field? I told him, I said, I ain't going to feel no more. I meant to die that day. That was my day to go. I said, I don't owe you nothing. I don't owe you a thing. You have to talk to my husband. He's the one to owe you. I don't owe you. I said, I'm going to get me a job. I said, I'm naked. My children naked. We're barefooted. Which we didn't have nothing. You know when they settled with us? The 15th day of March. Time to go back to fear. We were not going back to fear. Knocking corn stalk with a hole cutting them. Taking a stick and knocking them cotton stalk. I told him I wasn't going back to fear. He got so mad, he told my husband I was crazy. He needed to send me to asylum. 
I said, you need to send him there. Cause I ain't working no more. I meant I wasn't gonna work no more. I didn't did. I said, I don't mind helping him. Is he my husband? If I have time, I help him. I said, if I don't have time, I won't help him. I meant that. I didn't wait long enough. So she didn't really set out to be a midwife. And um, as we've seen, she stopped working in the field. So can you tell us a little bit about how the midwife uh, yeah, how that, how that happened. Well, first I want to make a little comment about that clip that you just saw. Um, when the boss man said that she was crazy, uh, and he said, you know, they need to send you to an asylum. And she said, well, they need to send you. You know, she, she really stood up. But what I didn't realize, just being a you know, young woman here from California, is that that word crazy meant, had it been spread out, that she should be lynched. It was that, ser you know, that is the baggage that was on that word, crazy. Wow. And there's some other, other little things in the film um, that kind of need a little translation or interpretation when she talks about the, the man, she's talking about God, or I'm going home, she's talking about heaven, things like that. But when, um, I think the first time she attended a birth by herself, she was about five years old. And her, her husband, her, somebody in the family went to get her to be with the woman in labor so that the husband could go then get the midwife. And so the baby came before the husband and midwife got back. I mean, we're talking about a time when there were, especially in the black community, but, and this is a very, Utah is a very tiny town in the rural south. No cars, no telephone, you know, no nothing, no money. So, um, at any rate, so I think that happened uh, several times to her, but she said um, this woman had 13 children, and she looked at me like, that's a lot of children, and she said, with the last one, she said, that's when I got tricked. <laughs> she meant the doctor, they, the husband did get the doctor. The doctor came and said, you know, why don't you be a midwife? You'd make a really good midwife. And she's going, no, 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 I, I don't want to be a midwife. But um, then this, she didn't want to go to the field either. So she did go and take a test at Tuskegee. And they gave her a license. It was, I think it was over a weekend, and I'm sure she, she knew men, much more than the person giving the test, you know. And so they gave her a license, and that kind of made Alabama semi-legal in terms of the way they treated that community. My goodness, in a, in a weekend, on a weekend she got a the certificate. Yes. And, um, and it's also really interesting how she was paid Right, so um, she was paid in produce and chickens and eggs and whatever people had to give her. And um, five dollars, if they had five dollars. And she said when it got up to fifty dollars, that's when they removed their licenses because they wanted the money, meaning the medical establishment wanted that money. Oh, so she was actually paid $50? I'm not sure. It would have been, you know, at the very end. Now, when you talk about the very end, for our viewers, we're talking about 1976, right? Right. right. When the midwifery law was changed. Right. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Well, um, what happened was there was this system of the granny midwives in the black community. Um, and they were kind of a central, important womb to tomb person. And people just went to them for more than, more than just having a baby. So, and I think they were somewhat chosen by the people there. So, so she, she was in that community practicing that way and that's the way it was. I mean, you, this is a population 
that couldn't go to the white hospitals anyway. And um, so then there was civil rights, there was the Voting Rights Act, uh, but even during the Civil Rights and the Voting Rights Act, people still wanted to go to the midwives, even though they had the ability legally to go to a hospital. It, uh, there was, it was expensive, they weren't welcome. Um, but in 1976, the law changed that because that's a, just after Medicare, Medicaid came in, and the federal government would pay for indigent women to give birth in hospitals. So they decided, oh, hmm. So they passed a law outlawing these midwives that they had licensed in the past, outlawing them. So forcing everybody to go to the hospitals. And then, of course, the C-section rate went up. I mean, here was a large part of the population in the United States, uh, I mean, the South, large part of the South, where for years uh, they had this system of granny midwives, and it worked fine. <laughs> right, and I think what, what was interesting to me is that they admitted that the doctor, I believe on your film, kept uh, Miss Margaret because she was so good. They kept her longer. Yeah, well, they didn't want to go to... Um, they didn't want to go to these homes. They didn't want to do that right. work. And so they kept her. And, and um, why do you think she's relevant today? I mean, what advice um, did, did Miss Margaret give that is so relevant today? Well, one of the things is, um, and this is on the film, she's talking to a, an obstetrician, uh, um, and... The obstetrician is saying, yeah, I think we rush things too much. And then Miss Margaret says, yes, it's patience. You have to know how to talk to a woman. Um, and she says, give them love. Give them kind words. They know what to do. You don't have to tell them. And she says, love and kind words, that beats it all. So, uh, you know, if we took the time to listen to women or just walk with them as they're in their labor, uh, be patient with them. Let, and in fact, in the film, she says, let, they can sit any way they want. They can do whatever they feel they need to do, eat whatever they want. That's important to a woman in labor. And I think we have hospitals with protocols that say you can't do this and you can't, do, you can't eat, you have to lie down, you know, lots of protocols that are counter to giving birth easily or naturally. Yes. And, um, you know, I, in preparation for talking to you today, I, <laughs> I, I did go on the Internet and I found this article in The Atlantic, actually, about um, a hospital in Southern California, Newport Beach, that reduce their unnecessary C-sections. How'd they do that? Uh, because, well, it says that they, um, I guess having a C-section costs a hospital a lot of money. And so they, their rate at the time in the early, it says early 2012, was about 38%, which was higher than the state average of 33%. And... Um, and the World Health Organization that's says, right. says, you know, come on, in an industrialized country like the U.S., it should be about 10. And if you go above 10 percent, then you're in a little dangerous territory because you're doing unnecessary cesarean right. sections that are harmful. Right. This, um, yeah. this senior program officer uh, said decreasing C-sections results in better health to mothers and better health to babies at lower costs. Yeah, that, amen. Having midwives is, right. is even better. Home birth is even better than that. <laughs> so, um, um, what, we're just about out of time, but what final thoughts do you want to leave us with about Miss Margaret and she just is such a compelling... She is. I want everybody to see the whole film, you know, Miss Margaret. Yeah, I love the music, and yeah. I just... 
it took me a long time to make this film because she was so important to me. I mean, I've made a lot of little films, uh, but this was the first really long one, and I didn't think I could do it. And so I, I, w I looked for other agencies to, come on, this is really an important topic. We don't want to lose this. This is one of the last of the granny midwives. She's great. Um, can you do it? There was n nobody would do it. So I just said, okay, I'll just do the best I can. And I'm so grateful. I'm so, I feel so blessed to have met her. And I'm so grateful that I got to participate in keeping this history alive. Right. I mean, it would have been lost. And, and the things I learned from her, oh my, <laughs> I've learned so much. Really? You know, I, I, I'd never really spent any time in the South. And going down there uh, was a big education for me. And I asked you this before, but uh, the the images in the film are so startling, so so much poverty. And is when you went back, did did oh, you? It's there. It's still there. Yeah, it's still there, and there's, oppression is still there, segregation is still there. We're just not aware of it. We don't see it. It's not in our face. We live in California. Everything, the sun shines. <laughs> so it's still uh, there in 2016. Yep. Well, I haven't been back since, oh, let's see, she passed away in 2004. And I haven't been back for many years now. Mm. So. But, um, well, if... Our viewers are interested in learning more about your films. They can go to your website, which is www.lovedelivers.org. It's a very empowering website for women and girl, young girls about um, natural birth. There's another website that I'm involved with. It's called um, worldbirthhub.com. And there are great stories from all around the world, and other filmmakers are on that one, too. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you for joining us it's today. And um, again, to our viewers, if you want to, it's about 37 minutes, isn't mm -hmm. it? The main program. The main yeah. program, Miss Margaret, the story of an Alabama granny midwife. Highly recommend it. And I'd like to thank our Seroptimus crew uh, for for helping us put on this program today. Special thanks to our engineer, Leon Johnson, for helping, and to the Buck Institute on Research and Aging for the use of their studio, and most of all, to you, our viewers, for watching today. Thank you. Yeah.